Good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us. It's Wednesday, November 18th, if you can believe it. Um, it's, it's been a wild 2020, to say the least. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time to join us today, which is our last all-call partner meeting for the Act on Homelessness Collaborative uh, for this year. So thanks again. Um, we have a few new folks joining us, so I am going to take the opportunity to um, explain who we are, what we're doing, um, the incredible work that our partners have been doing this year. We also have um, all of the details related to our common agenda. Um, and I think even the terminology common agenda is a little wonky. Um, so it really is the strategic plan um, for the city of Santa Barbara to address homelessness over the next three years. Um, so the opportunity that we have before us today is to go through the components of this plan, all of the goals, all of the strategies, how we will be assessing and measuring progress, reporting out to all of our community stakeholders, um, and how, again, we will, we will work to achieve our goals and objectives over the next three years. Um, so I'm Barbara Anderson. I'm the facilitator of the Act on Homelessness Collaborative. I joined the SBAC team in January of this year to take on this role. Um, and Jeff Schaefer, Director of Initiatives at SB Act. Both of us work closely um, on the Act on Homelessness Collaborative. We also have our two other team members joining us, Landon Rank, our Administrative Manager, who takes very detailed meeting minutes for every single meeting that we facilitate, um, and Rich Sander, our Executive Director, who provides oversight and leadership for all of our community initiatives. Um, so again, thank you and welcome. Um, we hope <laughs> that you can give us a relatively um, undistracted hour of your time. Um, again, this is an opportunity to hear from you, get your feedback, any questions that you have on our strategic plan um, before we put it in a beautiful paper format and share it and present it to the city council. Um, so again, at any point during this conversation, Landon is gonna be monitoring the chat box. If you have a comment, or want to provide feedback, or if you have a question, we will stop um, during the presentation to be an to answer those questions in a, in a timely manner. And um, we have plenty of time to go through the components of the plan. Um, we're also going to be providing an update of the work of our working groups. And so we have three working groups, homelessness prevention, housing and shelter, and lived experience, and then our regional action plans, um, which have been facilitated for almost a year on the east side and State Street of Santa Barbara um, and soon to be expanding to the waterfront. Again, the regional action plans are work that's happening in communities right now um, to address immediate concerns um, and issues as they arise, as well as work strategically to reduce the number of individuals experiencing homelessness in those neighborhoods. Jeff, is there anything else that you wanna add before we get started in terms of who we are and what we're doing and why we're here? <laughs> No, I would just say, you know, uh, I'm going to be presenting toward the end of the meeting, but looking back on the year and all the incredible work that you all have done through the, this very challenging year is already pretty amazing. And I'm very excited about the next uh, three years and what we can accomplish together. So that would be my, my first thoughts. Thanks, Jeff. And we just had the mayor join us and uh, she usually opens up our collaborative meeting. So I know that you just got on, um, but anything, uh, Mayor Maria, that you'd like to share as we get started this morning? No, just sorry I had trouble logging on. I love you all. Thank you for being here. Let's get to work. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. And I see, too, that we have Councilmember Herman on the call as well. Um, I know that she's been closely involved in our working groups and regional action plans. Um, as well as our uh, neighborhood navigation work as of last week. So, Councilmember Harmon, anything to share as we as we kick off the meeting this afternoon? Or sorry, thanks, this Barbara. Let's... Sorry, you guys, that I don't have <laughs> video right now, but um, just echoing Mayor Maria, so grateful for all your work and and really excited to dig in today and to to keep doing this good work for our community. So, thanks very much. Thank you. All right, I'm going to pop up my screen. and um, dig into what we call the common agenda. Um, but I'm gonna first start with where we've been and where we're headed, um, just to capture an overview. Again, for folks, especially those who 
are joining us um, for the first time. Can I get a thumbs up? Jeff, I can see you. Can you see the screen? Awesome. All right. So in 2019, um, the Act on Homelessness Collaborative was launched and formed. And so this was a public-private partnership um, initiated by the City of Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara Foundation to invest in what we call a collective impact-driven strategic planning process to address homelessness. So again, collective impact, wonky term, we'll get into the components of what we call a common agenda in just a minute. Um, but it really is an evidence-based and research-based process um, for working collaboratively to address complex social issues. Um, so again, it has a rigor and a level of accountability um, that it's unique um, in terms of other collaborations that are information sharing or resource sharing. Um, this definitely has a, a proven um, and evaluative structure. So SBF is the organization that serves as your backbone um, of the public-private partnership facilitating this planning process and making sure that um, we have the support and resources we need for impl implementation. So this year, our steering committee was formed um, and they met monthly um, to co-create and co-develop a common agenda again, to reduce the impacts of homelessness, specifically in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, so our steering committee had many representatives from the city, um, including our mayor serving as chair, um, Laura Doubles, housing and human services manager. Um, we also had Rob Fredericks from the Housing Authority of the city of Santa Barbara, Dr. Gleg Horn from Behavioral Wellness, um, Lieutenant Kushner from the police department, and Jessica Cadiente uh, newly joined us um, from the Central Library. Um, and the reason why I list that is we want to demonstrate and show that not only have we been working to engage the priorities of city officials and city departments and city staff, um, but we have also included nonprofit service providers that live and breathe this work every single day. Um, so Cottage Population Health, PATH, Transition House, New Beginnings Counseling Center, City Net the Downtown Organization or Downtown Santa Barbara, Eastside Society, the Santa Barbara Foundation, Social Venture Partners, and Home for Good Santa Barbara County, and County of Santa Barbara um, Homeless Assistance Program Manager, Kimberly Albers. Again, it's, it's been really important for us to coordinate at all of the levels of government. Um, we know that resources come in from all different avenues. Um, the goal of the common agenda and the goal of the collaboration is to leverage is ex is existing resources and make sure that we're increasing efficiency and effective effectiveness in deploying those resources in the community. So again, this year, the regionally based efforts were launched um, to specifically address the, the areas of Santa Barbara that are disproportionately impacted by homelessness. Um, so Jeff Schaefer um, has facilitated those regional action plans every single week. Um, and we also have more in-depth work happening on the east side. Um, and he'll speak to those a little bit later in the meeting this morning. So as we go into next year, um, we're looking at implementing the strategies and continuing to talk about them, refine them, um, make adjustments as necessary. Um, and that the regional action plans will be coordinated and continue to measure their outcomes or incremental progress on 60 or 90 day timelines. And then the SB Act capacity and backbone component is the accountability, the reporting, and really facilitating um, every opportunity to learn from the strategies we're implementing. And again, um, make sure that we're identifying gaps and resources and looking to see if we can address those gaps. Barbara, there's a question in the chat window about mm -hmm. incorporating the city of Goleta. Yeah, so um, the conversations actually between Goleta and the city of Santa Barbara have been happening. Um, and we were hoping to have, and I can't see right now because of the PowerPoint, um, folks from the city of Goleta learning about our priorities and our plans so that we can see if there's opportunities for alignment. Um, but Mayor Maria, do you want to speak to just the, the kind of partnership and the strategic conversations that have been happening with the city of Goleta administration? Thanks. So mm -hmm. what um, started the conversation was um, possibly using some airport properties for more safe parking opportunity. Um, and uh, the city of Santa Barbara, in case you don't know, we uh, the airport is our jurisdiction also 
land north of Hollister, including the railroad corridor there. So that's where Goleta and I, and uh, City of Santa Barbara, City of Goleta reps have been talking. And we're, we're keeping an ongoing conversation about how we can work together. But when we get down to the point of we need more beds, really that's the conversation where everyone has to come in and find that location uh, for, for more beds, yeah. See, Sharon Byrne is talking about Montecito. Yeah, we could invite um, Coast Village Road or other Montecito representatives, so yeah. It is supposed to be a city, this effort is City of Santa Barbara focused and funded, um, but we want everyone at the table because it is uh, obviously a regional, national uh, effort. So we want everyone at the table, but our, Technically, it is City of Santa Barbara focus. Um, the opportunity that we've had with our housing and shelter working groups, as well as our homelessness prevention working group, is to include um, representatives and key stakeholders from other communities throughout Santa Barbara County. Um, just like Mayor Murillo has emphasized, you know, we know a lot of these solutions um, can't just be addressed um, and facilitated within the city without coordinating with other jurisdictions. Um, so that is absolutely our priority. Um, and again, not to take up more time <laughs> of city officials and other leaders, um, but I think the housing and shelter working group conversations have proven to already be really valuable um, to learn a little bit more about um, what's ahead in terms of housing development, um, where we could look at um, strategically increasing uh, shelter bed capacity. And again, we'll get to those specific goals a little bit later, um, but we want to encourage, again, participation um, from everyone who is committed and prioritizing these strategies moving forward. So quickly, just touching on what we call the common agenda. Um, so again, there's key components to this agenda, which include guiding principles, a problem definition and or mission statement, um, goals that are specific and measurable, a framework for change, which is how we're gonna achieve those goals over the designated period of time, and the plan for learning. So what are indicators for progress, how we measure our outcomes, and how we report on those outcomes um, to our leadership. So the steering committee um, that I articulated before, this diverse, really experienced group of leaders coming together to set the components of each um, of the common agenda critical core pieces uh, over the last year. And actually it's been exactly a year since our first all call meeting last November. Um, so we're happy to share with you um, that this part of our work um, is headed toward completion, again, to be presented to the city council for discussion and approval. So guiding principles, again, there's a lot of, of text on your screen, but I think all of you are familiar with really setting a tone of, of mutual support and mutual respect and collaborative dialogue, um, making sure that we're honoring diversity and inclusivity, um, that we're really looking at leveraging and maximizing existing resources, um, that we support each other. We have a discourse that's productive and important, um, but as a steering committee and as a collaboration, we support each other um, in working to address the challenges in reducing the impacts of homelessness in our community. Moving forward, our problem definition. So I know that this has been shared um, at an all-call meeting um, before, but again, important to kind of revisit where we are because this problem definition is specific but also all-encompassing. It's this nice bridge um, between addressing really the continuum of care um, as the county refers to it and others, um, but also again specifically addressing the city of Santa Barbara. So our community members in the city of Santa Barbara are experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness and the effects are widespread. The Act on Homelessness Collaborative is committed to reducing and preventing homelessness and its impacts in the city of Santa Barbara by working in partnership using a variety of innovative solutions. So I do want to emphasize that this problem definition was actually created in February of this year prior to responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, after revisiting this problem definition um, again in May of this year, 
Um, it was uh, the, the guidance of the steering committee that we not adjust um, and know that um, a lot of the need is going to increase and has increased over the last few months. Um, and it will, we are anticipating increasing into 2021 um, when certain protections like eviction moratoriums um, are lifted as well as when resources um, are exasperated. So right now we have had incredible rental assistance programs. We have service providers stepping up. We have philanthropy investing in those service providers to be able to address the needs of clients. Um, but we know that, that this, in terms of our mission and what we're committed to achieving in the next three years, uh, will be challenging at best, <laughs> but that's what we like to do um, is, is confront those challenges and our role as SBS is to try to remove as many barriers as possible to achieving this goal. So these are our four high level three year common agenda goals. Um, and I'm starting with the wonky jargony <laughs> version of these goals um, because the way they're written right now is important when we look at the homeless management information set system and collecting data and analyzing that data, which is the, the county and home for good of Santa Barbara County, Northern Santa Barbara County facilitates, um, as well as our service providers that have specific government contracts um, that have specific uh, federal and state relationships and county relationships. The languaging here is important, um, but after this slide, I'm trying to break down in a much more tangible way what these goals mean. Um, so goal number one, increasing the number of affordable housing units in the city of Santa Barbara by 20%. Goal number two, strengthening the capacity of organizations that provide permanent housing placement services to increase the rate of housing retention by 5%. Create a culture and diversion diversion and prevention among collaborative partners to reduce the percentage of individuals, youth, and families entering homelessness from a house situation by 10%. And then the last goal being strengthen the coordination and availability of outreach and case management services for individuals, youth, and families experiencing homelessness by 25%. So in very simple terms, we have to implement all of these strategies simultaneously to address systemically the issue of homelessness. And so I think efforts in the past in terms of where resources are directed or capacity of agencies, um, it's been let's focus on this community, this approach, this organization and try to ramp up to address homelessness. I think what we've all learned from all of those previous efforts is that we have to multitask. So <laughs> multitasking is going to be important um, as we move forward, and again, um, that SBS can take on the burden of, of making sure that we're managing um, the achievement of, the, of these goals over the next three years. So Chuck had a suggestion that affordable housing may be too broad. Shouldn't we focus on number of homeless people moved off the streets into permanent housing? So this was a discussion with our steering committee. Again, great, great point. Um, is that can we address housing insecurity in general, right? And look for more affordable housing units that span very low, low and moderate income thresholds um, to look at opportunities, again, to prevent homelessness as well. Um, so we know affordable housing in general has been one of the, the key components and contributors to homelessness. And can we look at it a, a little bit more holistically? Shelter bed capacity, and transitioning individuals that are experiencing homelessness into permanent housing is part of our strategies related to this goal, but we did want it to be a little bit more broad. Any other questions or, or feedback on the goals right now? Again, we're, we're gonna keep going deeper into more detail. Okay, goal number one, again, increasing the number of affordable housing units. So there's been efforts um, at the county level and the city level to identify vacant and underutilized lots in each district. Um, what we have found from the conversations and partner interviews that SB Act facilitated early on and conversations that have been ongoing is that this really needs to be a shared responsibility among all districts in the city of Santa Barbara. 
Uh, so no one neighborhood or one community feels like they're taking on a disproportionate part of the burden of addressing homelessness. Um, and for us, it's not necessarily a burden, it's a challenge. We feel it's a challenge that can be overcome um, and that, that every, everyone deserves the right to be um, in a safe and secure home. So we really wanna make sure that we're looking at the availability of vacant and underutilized lots in every district um, and that we're looking at both a short-term and long-term plan in coordination with the city and county housing authority, um, as well as other nonprofit housing providers. Um, there are unique opportunities ahead of us, we know, um, that, that come as a result of an economic recession, um, but also ones that we know come because philanthropy, social impact investing, other really innovative and creative approaches and solutions are being facilitated um, and, and really spoken about by, by key leaders in our community. So increasing the engagement of collaborative partners in advocacy. Um, so again, it's important that we take and seize every opportunity to be heard, that we advocate for innovative solutions that are being proposed, and that we look at facilitating conversations among community members and with neighborhoods understanding their concerns and reaching really mutually beneficial and mutually supported solutions. Um, so we want to do this hard work ahead of time um, so that if there are funds available that we're able to seize those opportunities to deploy those funds in the community. Um, and I know at the county level, um, Kimberly Albers and her team are looking at all of the creative opportunities that have come as a result of COVID-19 um, and the city of Santa Barbara looking at can we expand case management and outreach and, and those services to address immediate impacts and then look at those long-term solutions. I think the housing authority is absolutely front and center um, at looking at every opportunity that's available to the city um, and, and really looking forward and moving forward to the solutions that are, that are co-created and co-developed with community members. And then the last piece, looking at ADUs. Again, an opportunity that there's more ADUs um, in the process uh, with the planning commission and permitting processes, et cetera, um, than any other uh, shared housing or uh, or affordable housing opportunities. So can we look at this as an opportunity um, to work with organizations like Partners in Housing Solutions um, that are facilitating both landlord incentives, um, as well as rent subsidies, as well as risk management programs. Um, so again, goal number one, and these are strategies um, over the next year um, to be refined at the end of 2021. Any questions or feedback on goal number one? Okay, goal number two. So once they're housed, we want them to be and remain successfully housed. Um, so increasing the rate of housing retention. So we have high housing retention rates um, through the Homeless uh, Management Information System, which is a variety of partners um, that share their data with the County of Santa Barbara. Um, but we're looking at, are there opportunities for us to increase um, once the housing placement services, the capacity of housement placement, excuse me, housing placement services organizations. <laughs> um, as, as we facilitate that process, are there things that we can do on the front end um, while they're housed, um, as well as looking at the data, if evictions occur, um, are there best practices or interventions that we can identify as a result of that, that data that we're seeing? So the first is, let's look at eviction data and can we target housing uh, authority of the city of Santa Barbara data to go really specific in terms of what has been proven to be successful and what has proven to be a, a bit challenging. And from that data, um, can we look at increasing engagement and communication for current support services and partners um, to regularly address individuals of concern? Again, we know that it's all hands on deck, right? It, it takes a, a variety of partners to support individuals, especially those who have experienced chronic homelessness to be able to adjust to a house environment. Um, and then the, the last two pieces being really deliverable oriented, you know, can we create a really streamlined, um, consistent, good neighbor approach um, and handbook, uh, tools and resources to teach life skills, um, again, and, and make sure things like putting out the trash and paying rent on time and observing quiet hours, all the things that we're used to as renters and homeowners and good neighbors, um, and, and supporting that process with those who are, who are newly housed for the first time. Um, and then the last piece is financial resources. 
um, and key partner agencies to really look at can we build capacity for bridge or transitional housing um, if there's an opportunity to support individuals in that way. Um, again, we have a couple of comments. Um, the Housing Authority and Rob, it's just in terms of eviction data. Um, yeah, we want to reduce the return to homelessness. Um, so even if a particular property um, isn't the best suited for an individual, can we find and locate another property and transition, trans transition them to another location based on their specific needs? Um, and then Chuck saying, is the issue lack of support, so if the issue is lack of support services, should there be a commitment to increasing access to and funding of those services? Absolutely. Um, so this last piece of um, really looking at flexible financial resources, um, and we can raise for particular purposes and solutions, but also really advocating for an increase in the supportive services at housing development properties. And so I, I appreciate that that um, Kimberly Albers with the county is a huge advocate for making sure that if, if we have a housing first approach, that those supportive services are just as robust as the permanent supportive housing uh, solutions that are being funded and facilitated. And Rob, again, echoing that from the housing authority perspective, saying those support services on site, robust, um, continuous, available at all hours, every single day of the week, um, we know is especially critical and crucial um, for individuals to be successfully housed. And going into goal number three, so reducing the number of individuals that are, enter homelessness. There's a lot of strategies at play. Um, as I mentioned previously, rental assistance programs, eviction protection, um, legal assistance by the Legal Aid Foundation and others, all working together to make sure that we keep individuals and families in their homes. Um, so for this goal number three, we really want to focus on diversion and prevention, um, knowing that diversion in rapid resolution is low cost, high impact. So again, I'll, I'm using terminology that's a little jargony and wonky. As we get deeper into the presentation, I break this down further. Um, so diversion and rapid resolution are just, uh, you know, fancy ways <laughs> of saying, how can we prevent individuals from entering the system altogether? or if they're in the system for a short period of time, can we work on solutions um, for them to be re reunified with family? If they had an employment opportunity in another location, can we facilitate them getting to that other location, getting there safely and finding housing in that new location, uh, making sure, sure that they have the support that they need to address immediate concerns. Um, and again, if there are housing solutions available for their particular um, circumstance, can we facilitate um, them uh, being transitioned to those housing solutions? So it really is, can we quickly look at every opportunity that's available to us with, a, with you know, multiple conversations, building trust with an individual, finding out their story, where they came from, what happened? I think all of us who've worked in homelessness and those of you who have worked in homelessness for, for a decade or longer, um, know that that trust building conversation is key, um, identifying and understanding where the turn happens, right? You know, all of us um, at one time or another, or if not currently living to paycheck to paycheck, um, if we have a circumstance like an unexpected uh, medical diagnosis, an unexpected car repair, or anything that occurs that just causes us to miss a rent payment, right? that easily can trickle into um, a situation of someone entering homelessness. Um, so can we go back? Can we say, is there an opportunity for us to rehouse that person? Um, if they're employed, we have a lot of our vehicular homeless that are employed. Um, so what is that gap that we can work to address a more affordable housing solution for them? So this is the diversion, rapid resolution um, type conversations that you'll hear us say over and over and over again. Um, diversion solutions tend to range from $300 to $900 per individual. Um, you'll see later the, the cost amounts related to um, longer term solutions. Um, so this is just really our, um, I would say the steering committee's experience, just experience over the last decade 
uh, as well as others to say, can we put more resources and more capacity here, train more providers, both traditional and non-traditional, as well as advocate for flexibility of resources. So when it is a whatever it takes approach of helping folks not enter homelessness or leave homelessness relatively quickly, um, those flex flexible resources are key. And that's what we've heard. And, and Chuck pointed this out. Supportive services when they're housed, flexible resources um, when they're entering homelessness. We know we need to maximize both government resources that are a little bit more restrictive and dedicated and targeted to specific solutions with private philanthropic investment that gives the flexibility. It's, it's that pairing we know from experience is, is going to be able to get us where we need to go. Any questions or input on goal number three? Goal number four, so outreach and case management. Again, um, you know, I think you've heard us say this many times before. Um, but really looking at that first point of interaction, the first point of relationship building. Um, and a lot of these individuals, as you'll see in a little bit with the data, have experienced incredible trauma in their lives. Um, so their ability to open up, their ability to trust, um, especially those who have been part of the system and have been burned by the system, um, it, it takes a lot of time um, in case management um, to be able to understand what their needs are um, and be able to address those needs. Um, so regional action plans, again, Jeff will talk about this in detail in terms of how we're approaching this and what we're facilitating there, um, as well as specialized outreach teams. So this is includes um, mental health specialists, um, law enforcement, healthcare workers. Um, this has been demonstrated with SB Connect Home, with CityNet and Cottage Hospital and law enforcement and fire. Um, there was a report out at our last all call meeting about the outcomes of that work. Um, anything, again, all hands on deck, whatever it takes type approaches to meeting an individual where they're at and, and, and successfully getting them to the next, the next step. And then the last piece was the neighborhood navigation. So this is really uh, one in um, tied into the regional action plan. So regional action plans addressing immediate concerns, business owners, uh, community leaders, residents, um, as well as service providers coming together to understand are there things that we can do in short periods of time to reduce overall impacts. The neighborhood navigation being a level of coordinated support and services helping folks uh, that are experiencing homelessness um, with their with their immediate needs whether it's food, shower, healthcare, um, you know, care for their animals, um, mail, you know, things like that. So we have a lot of partners coming together, um, even at Alameda Park for over a decade, and Jeff will speak to this a little bit later. Can we formalize that approach? Can we demonstrate that we're reducing impacts of homelessness in those neighborhoods as a result of the services that are being provided? Um, so again, expanding capacity, advocating and directing more resources, but also leveraging the incredible teams we have doing outreach and case management with a combination of support and services um, as we move forward over the next few years. Chuck is also saying, under which goal would the work with the community to avoid the strong NIMI response fall? Will SB Act help providers like the Housing Authority and People's Self-Help Housing with efforts to convince residents of the need and suitability of these projects? Um, so we have under um, goal number one is the increasing engagement of collaborative partners as well as working in communities um, to do the critical work beforehand. Um, so understand are there opportunities for vacant or underutilized under lots? So even if they're not in process, have they been identified? Does the housing authority you know, have vetted them to a certain extent that they could be an opportunity? and in their timeline where best we can work to engage neighbors um, and community members in, in those solutions. Um, we're also doing a lot of work on the east side um, to look at uh, what is the priority of residents? You know, what, what is it that they want to target um, and coordinate and help us with? Um, and so right now, case management outreach is the top priority uh, looking at the vehicular homeless. Are there opportunities that we can, we can support those indiv individuals as those numbers are growing? Um, and again, can we look at affordable housing solutions 
On the east side, the target, the target and the priority has been working families. But in other communities, can we look at other opportunities? Um, and Chuck, to be totally honest too, that's why we're looking at navigation concepts that are not physical structures. Um, I think navigation centers and shelters, um, that has been, you know, and, and rightfully so, considerable pushback in certain neighborhoods and communities. But can we do something a little bit more creative um, that it's not necessarily a physical structure that requires that level of investment um, and long-term sustainability, but could we look at something meeting folks where they're at um, and that can be scaled or moved depending on um, the impacts to that community. So being a little bit more creative, um, but then also working to build the buy-in way before um, on these solutions before they go before the city council. I, that, it, that it really is the goal here. Um, and listening to the community members to understand um, what their priorities are and can we look at housing solutions that are creative to meet those priorities. And Jeff, you were sharing something here. Do you wanna to speak to that in terms of behavioral wellness? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure John was on the call, I think. Um, and behavioral wellness is very active within the RAPS and the neighbor, joining the Neighborhood Navigation Center idea now, active with law enforcement, city net, in trying to help uh, those who are suffering from mental health issues. I don't know if John, you wanna to speak to that briefly? I think yes, we are, we're in collab, we work in collaboration with uh, city net, uh, local law enforcement in terms of working with uh, the homeless population. We're also given uh, certain areas encampments where we're going out and engaging those folks in different areas in our South Coast meetings on Tuesday mornings where we hear about encampments from uh, Emily Allen and our, the rest of our group and our AmeriCorps workers accompany our Be Well staff to engage these folks in these di different areas that are that are being uh, identified and and our partners are requesting engagement with these folks and then they come back to to us in our meetings to give us an outcome of those engagements and and identifying people who may need uh, both mental health and substance use disorder treatment and also in need of housing resources. And, and John, could you speak to what, what are the actual transitional, what are the options for people you're working with as far as shelter, transitional housing, and housing currently? Well, basically, uh, it's, the, uh, it's our contract beds at, um, at PATH, and then also our contract beds at uh, the hospitality house and i'm also reminding the staff to consider when they meet with someone that self-identifies as a veteran that there are veteran beds at the uh, hospitality house that are available and to have those homeless individuals that identify themselves as veterans who are willing to make that effort to maintain sobriety while living in that environment, that, that, that that's an option for housing in a quick way. And we have uh, talked to the hospitality house staff on hours of availability to drop in and, and inquire about those beds. And also we talk about the uh, the availability of beds at the rescue mission and when to check in for those beds as well. Great, thank you. Thanks for being on the call. Welcome. And Chuck, I'm gonna point to you because you've been at this <laughs> for many years, although still looking really young, <laughs> um, that you've been the director of C3H, right? You've been a director of what started out as a collective impact initiative, um, working at PATH, then subsequently after that. Um, and you're in a unique role now in that you're, you're gonna be transitioning to consulting where, where we get to engage with you on your wisdom and opinion, as well as best practices. So as we go into how we're gonna measure progress and, and report out um, uh, outcomes. Anything you wanna share just in terms of goals, 
strategies, the ability of agencies to work together to, to implement this over uh, the next few years and, and what you've learned. Um, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I am available to help uh, both SB Act and, and anybody else on the call, including cities and, and uh, nonprofits who want support around implementing some of these strategies. Um, I would love to be engaged. Um, what we learned with C3H was that, you know, solidifying commitments on the part of local government and the agency partners is critical to moving forward. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to look like formal memorandum of understanding. It's more about agreeing, doing what you guys are doing, developing this plan and everybody coming together and saying, yes, we agree to it. And I think, Barbara, you put your finger on a key way to make sure that we are successful, which is to report out measurable impacts. I know that Jeff hasn't mentioned it yet, but he has very specific targeted goals for his regions. And I think sharing those sharing and communicating the success on an ongoing basis with all of the different stakeholders is both challenging and essential. Um, uh, Council member Harmon indicated that the elected officials can be a real important uh, conduit for spreading the word uh, about the work that's being done and, and sharing it, but that means that the elected officials themselves have to be kept informed. So we can't just rely on Jeff and Barbara and Landon to do the heavy lifting of all of this work. Um, we really have to all be engaged day after day in the community efforts. And one of the things I do wanna give a plug to is that Jeff leads a really entertaining meeting. Um, so don't dread the, the numbers of meetings that we're gonna have to be doing to do this. The coordination itself <laughs> moves the ball forward. Um, and, and, it, and we really see, I mean, just evidence of that is C3H, our, our success was the cre was working with Emily Allen and Home for Good and Eddie Taylor to create a coordinated entry system, to create a non-conflicted uh, continuum of care, meaning that it isn't just providers um, deciding where the money goes, but a broader based community helping to impact how the money decisions are made. Um, and, and really educating each of the local governments so that we now see across the region the local governments developing comprehensive plans of their own to do this work. And finally, we have to, I just constantly am tipping my hat to Kimberly Albers, who I think was one of the direct results of us really pushing the county to take this problem more seriously. And they brought on board Kimberly and Kimberly has hired this great group of staff to, to take the next steps towards implementing uh, programs, policies and funding and solutions going forward. So I think the groundwork has been laid very beautifully, and, and I'm eager to participate in the process moving forward. Thank you so much, Chuck, for the insights and just all the great feedback and questions. Um, I think for us, you know, what's so unique about this process is that we have been able to have um, essentially a group planning process, which has been, you know, both timely, but really, really important um, and building the critical and buy-in and engagement that's needed to make sure that we can implement these strategies um, out of the gate and, and really look toward um, it, it going successfully. Um, and that we've had um, city council and the mayor uh, commit to the rigor of this process, um, that it, the process is collaborative um, and that we're looking at extending that engagement um, to every constituent um, in the community that is concerned um, and passionate and committed to addressing homelessness. Um, so it really is uh, the work of SB Act and others um, to facilitate education, outreach, um, to have those critical conversations, have those conversations be continuous, right, and, and frequent, um, and make sure, again, that, that, that every individual feels heard and that we're incorporating concerns, questions, great feedback, best practices, lessons learned, and everything that we're doing along the way. So um, I really just appreciate the thoughtful approach and I appreciate, to the commitment of our leadership team and all of you um, for really being involved and, and even through a, a global pandemic with all of your other responsibilities and all of your stresses that we have had folks engage and show up um, and really be 
honest about feedback. Um, and so, yeah, we have a fun meeting. Thanks, Jeff, for, for saying that. <laughs> We're so much better in person, but still, <laughs> um, that we'll do our best, that we'll do our best um, to do this virtually. Um, and again, that we're regularly communicating. If something works, great. If something fails, we'll own that. Um, and that we're reporting out incremental progress at every opportunity. So that's what I want to get to quickly um, before I turn to um, our regional action plans and working groups. So again, looking at the goals by the numbers. And so speaking of, of, of Kimberly Albers and her incredible team, Lucille and Jet and others um, at the county, you know, this is the point in time count data. And I pulled from 2019, although there is updated data from 2020, um, because the 2019 has this deeper level of analysis. So again, county, individual, um, over 1,800, 423 of those experiencing chronic homelessness, again, this is a specific definition of homelessness in terms of uh, experiencing homelessness for more than a year or um, in a sustained 12-month period or multiple um, experiences with homelessness um, over a designated period of time. Um, looking at, again, all of what we know, which is what are those disabling conditions, physical disabilities, substance abuse, mental health. And again, this is why we're advocating for specialized outreach teams. Um, and that we have all partners collaborating together to provide this level of case management and supportive services um, to individuals experiencing homelessness. And that Santa Barbara County is their home. Um, these are our residents um, and the uh, ability and responsibility for us to make sure that we're taking care of our residents is really important for us to emphasize, um, again, as we, we approach what we know is challenging work. So Santa Barbara city level data, this is 2019, um, 834 individuals. So um, as of 2020, this grew to 914 individuals um, in the city itself. But 2019 data, 62 months is the average length of time of, of experiencing homelessness. 69% experiencing chronic homelessness. 58 stating that emotional, physical, or sexual trauma caused their current episode of homelessness and looking at sleeping conditions, um, shelters, vehicles, and outdoors. We will share this data specific to the regional action plans and neighborhoods. That data has been updated um, uh, because of the incredible work of CityMap um, as of this year. So Jeff will speak to that a little bit later. Looking at families. So in 2019, 48 families experiencing homelessness, 29 assessed um, by coordinated entry. Again, Chuck speaking to Home for Good in Northern Santa Barbara County in the County of Santa Barbara, uh, looking at the length of time of homelessness, 32 months, those experiencing chronic homelessness, 35%, and then 55%, right? Um, what caused their current episode of homelessness? So just trying to provide some context of the challenges that we're, we're needing to address, um, as well as where these folks are located. Knowing that our shelters are at capacity um, and there's strategic opportunities for us to facilitate referrals with rescue mission and PATH, um, and that has been uh, being able to be facilitated through neighborhood navigation and regional action plans and others. Um, but this, this is, in terms of overall data, um, what we're confronting. Um, and then there's a question about what defines a, a family. Um, and so that is uh, to, to, uh, to adults um, and including children and or including children. I, I think, uh, Barbara, in this case, I think we were mm -hmm. using uh, including minor children. So a Great. couple wouldn't be considered a family. With minor children. Thank you, Kimberly, for clarifying that. So this is the incredible, incredible data capture from the County of Santa Barbara's recent phase two community action plan. Again, this has been drafted. Um, the county has um, put this out for feedback. Um, I know from key providers and constituencies and others. Um, and Kimberly, if you wanna to speak to this to any level of depth, um, I pulled this because this is important for folks to see, especially those um, of you that aren't necessarily involved in homelessness day to day, in terms of the need specific to the city of Santa Barbara emergency shelter beds, transitional housing, permanent supportive housing, and other permanent housing, um, and what the estimated cost 
of those beds or units are, and then the total need captured for the city itself. So this was by region um, facilitated and then reported in the plan um, in county totality. And the ranges of cost um, in terms of transitional housing, the 45 to $100 per bed per night is that we, we are looking creatively at motel hotel um, transitional um, housing situations as a result of COVID-19. That has been facilitated by Project Room Key in the County of Santa Barbara, um, but we don't rule it out as an innovative solution or opportunity moving forward. Um, and so I wanted to provide a little bit of a range there. And then also looking at the permanent supportive housing, you know, it costs quite a bit. Um, the $400,000 estimate is included in the County of Santa Barbara plan, but the Johnson Court 16 unit um, for our homeless veterans was 477,000 per unit. So again, providing a range there, um, so we understand um, you know, the gravity of what we're dealing with, um, as well as the total amount to, to address the current need. And again, this is for having a rotation of folks you know, in and out of emergency shelter and transitional housing. Um, and Kimberly adding that this is an average of current shelter providers taken from um, the city of Santa Barbara. And, and and just that was countywide, mm -hmm. um, Barbara. Sorry, <laughs> I just oh, want to make sure. The forty-five dollars, not the yeah, the, the forty-five dollars per bed city. per night was um, is Thank based you. on an, an average of um, current shelter providers. I think Chuck had mentioned that it seemed low, and we would agree that um, oftentimes we, we see it running around sixty dollars per night. But when we actually look mm -hmm. at current shelter providers across um, the county, uh, forty-five dollars was the average. Thank you so much for clarifying that. So 262 being specific to the city of Santa Barbara and then the $45 being an average of countywide uh, shelter providers. Again, knowing that there's this, this range and different providers have a, a different uh, per bed cost. Any questions on the, the big numbers? You know, Barbara, I was just going to jump in again. This is Kimberly and just share that, you know, oftentimes I think we see the 92 million and of course it's much larger countywide and we think of, well, gosh, that that's impossible. Right. But, um, but what we see, right, is because of low income housing tax credits and other funding sources is that a small percentage of that actually comes from local dollars, right? It's having, uh, you know, so much of what you talked about today, having the land available and a developer willing to apply for these other funding sources. And so um, when we're talking about actually housing development, um, it, a fraction of that would actually come from local dollars. Most of that is being ready and prepared to apply for projects um, at, the, um, at the state and federal level. Yeah, Barbara, this is Rob. I, I agree with Kimberly. The uh, the power of leverage is is great with use, utilizing other funds like the low income housing tax credit, where eighty to ninety percent of that ninety two million is paid for through outside funds like the, the low income housing tax credits and whatnot. Absolutely, and we have the folks that are in it every day to say it's possible. <laughs> the number looks impossible, but it's all possible. Um, so, so I think, again, putting it into context for those that aren't in it every day and, and providing the additional um, insights of the Housing Authority works miracles. I'm, I'm just going to say that <laughs> in terms of uh, sources um, that are being, you know, leveraged and facilitated to, to make these developments happen. Um, so in, in honoring the time that we have left, I'm going to go through quickly what we call the plan for learning. And so that is the data, collection and analysis, measuring progress, et cetera. Oh, we have a hand raised, our city attorney. Oh, hi. Can mm -hmm. you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I just wanted to throw one point of information in on the numbers slide. Uh, there's a interesting case out of San Francisco from last summer that says that a voter sponsored initiative can pass a special tax, that's a tax for a specific purpose, by a simple majority vote. That's big news because in the past, uh, if we were to try and fund something like building a police station, that specifically, a two-thirds vote would have been required. And uh, 
coincidentally, the San Francisco tax at issue was a business tax to provide homeless services. So there are funding alternatives out there independent of the government. Uh, the key here is that the city council or board of supervisors could not put that kind of tax on without a two thirds vote of the people, but the voters may. So I think we have an opportunity for a grassroots mobilization in our future. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. That's great. And again, just, just being creative about how we can um, identify and, and facilitate new sources of revenue to address what we know is, is the crisis of homelessness. So as we move on again quickly through the, what we call the plan for learning. So please know, and I did not want to overwhelm you because I've already overwhelmed you with PowerPoint slides today. Um, we have identified indicators. So these are metrics um, for each of these goals and strategies um, that will be monitored. And I'm going to get to how frequently we're going to be reporting out, um, and, as well as the existing sources for that data. Um, so our goal as SB Act is not to burden organizations and partners with more data collection, but is how can we utilize the data you already collect and report out um, and really look at assessing the progress towards these goals and strategies. Um, so our group learning and our group activities, I want to touch on quickly, but please know we have measurable indicators that have been, been identified for each strategy um, for the four goals. So looking at something multifaceted, flexible, adaptable. We have just what collective impact is in terms of its design and implementation, which has been happening over the last year. And then we have our intermediate outcomes, which we'll start reporting out um, in 2021. And then we have our long-term outcomes. Our summative evaluation is, did we achieve what we set out to achieve? Um, and that will happen in 2023 after our three-year um, design and plan will be assessed really looking at every opportunity to learn with all of you. So steering committee meetings, working group meetings, creating this culture of participation and engagement, and learning from other leaders. You know, at every opportunity we get recommendations like, hey, I hear this community is doing really good work on diversion. Can we bring in, um, you know, their program lead to learn about what they've uh, implemented and what they've learned? So again, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're learning from others. We're refining as we go. Um, and we're making those adjustments and reporting that out um, to all of our partners. Learning across the collaboration. So we will be conducting appreciative inquiry interviews um, that has already started with the support of, of interns that we're working with on the east side, surveying, um, making sure that we're hearing from partners, what's productive, what's valuable, what are we learning, what are your needs, um, and making sure that we're continuing to come together just to understand, hear, address concerns, and make adjustments as we go. So it's really that simple. All of the rigor of reporting out on indicators um, is the responsibility of SB Act. Obviously, we need partners to share that data, um, and that is uh, facilitated through our partnership agreements. Um, so again, making sure that we're accountable to you all, um, and we're accountable to the city council, and we're accountable to our other donors and foundations as well. So this is how often you can expect a report. So our regional action plans are weekly. So those are 60 to 90 day plans. Jeff will speak to that in just a moment. Um, they meet uh, every Friday right now. Every Friday morning, our East Side and State Street uh, regional action plans meet. Um, and we're consistently talking about, are we uh, facilitating what we set out to do? The working groups are now meeting monthly. And so those meetings are now scheduled throughout 2021. Um, we have homelessness prevention, as well as um, housing and shelter working groups. And then our lived experience working group um, is actually going to be facilitated with the help of, of Chuck and our uh, uh, steering committee member, uh, Roger Powell. Um, and again, monthly progress reports on strategies for each of the working groups. Lastly, the all call partners, which is this convening. This happens quarterly. Um, and so through the quarter, um, we will have steering committees, we will have several working group meetings, and we'll have multiple wraps to be able to report out at the end of each quarter the progress from those last three months. Um, not just progress, but learning. And um, so if we've had to make adjustments, if we've had to exit 
a strategy or the opportunity to scale because we've received more resources that can be directed to that effort. And then we have our leadership and oversight. So our steering committee in 2021 will also be meeting quarterly. They'll meet at the top of the quarter. So again, they'll hear from us on progress. Um, and then the all call partners uh, meeting will be in the middle of the quarter. Um, and then we look at to um, our, our partners with all of you, you'll receive an annual report with progress on indicators and outcomes. Um, and the city council, same thing. So when we look at those high level four goals, those will be annually reported on. When we look at the intermediate strategies, those will be reported on quarterly. Any questions on where we are, when you'll hear about progress um, and our ability to you know, commit to you wholeheartedly transparency. Okay, we're moving on. Working groups. All right, enough of me talking, thank goodness. <laughs> um, we're gonna go into, uh, again, what we have created, which is three working groups. Um, and I will hand it over to Jeff to talk about what the group's purpose is, and then we'll dig into um, what are the particular tools and tactics that we facilitate at the working group level. Take it away, Jeff. All right, so thanks, Barbara. I'm glad to get a little break here. Um, so if you, you have a little reactions, uh, thing down at the bottom of your Zoom call. And I will hope that you'll use that, those during this different part of the call. And I hope you'll hang in there with me as I work through the working groups. I'm not gonna go back to everything we talked about in our common agenda goals to what necessarily these working groups are, are trying to achieve, except to dive in a little bit with like three stories related to homeless prevention, housing and shelter, and lived experience. Some of these are in progress, but I also wanna be able to look back on all the good work that you've all done this past year and really kind of, of, of celebrate it. Um, and so when we talk about, one of the things we talk about is this culture of diversion or rapid resolution or reunification, right? And the word reunification probably works better on this call. Um, the idea is how do, we, how do we shorten the amount of time that people are experiencing homelessness through the strategy of diversion reunification? How do we help them not enter into our coordinated entry system actually and divert them to a more successful short-term, more successful immediate um, outcome for stability with a family member, an agency, a, an employment opportunity outside of the county potentially. Um, and when I talk about reunification, of course, all the homework's being done. You call, you call the agency or the, or the person on the, on the other end. You make sure it's a safe situation. You work with law enforcement to do a background check. All that's kind of a given. But the reason why we, we talk about creating this culture of diversion and expanding the amount of people that understand this outcome and the, this idea is because we have a heck of a lot of faith communities and volunteers that are also involved and no individuals and families experiencing homelessness by name. And they're not attached to the system. So now that when I was just uh, running a meal sharing and I was just Jeff, people talk to me differently than they do now as Jeff, who's a part of the system that they perceive as either helping them or letting them down. There's a huge part of the community who doesn't trust me in the same way because I'm connected to something that they think has not maybe at the current time or in the past helped them. Whereas volunteers, your average, um, person who just loves people on the streets, wants to meet them where they're at and help them uh, get clothing or help them get a shower or whatever it is, help, help their pets get groomed, has a unique relationship and ability to talk about things that maybe I don't have. So last night we did a training for our partners at the Neighborhood Navigation Center, with some of our faith community partners and Adam's Angels and uh, some of our providers around the call. And CityNet hosted a diversion, a, a very brief diversion training, basically just saying what it is, how to connect them with CityNet, and then what would happen. And one of the women who works with um, Adams Angels basically said, I have two candidates for two things. One is for a potential uh, diversion reunification. And one person I've been working with long term that has done so many things correctly, and, uh, but just had, needs some help finding housing. And on that call, we were able to make some connections that are probably in the works today as far as are these two options that can now be put in play 
because we took an hour last night and just basically informed people who had never heard of the idea before on what it means. So we believe the more people that understand the strategy and connect um, to all the partners that are doing it, we have a vast array of partners locally that are doing diversion. But if we can utilize that more, we can help more people out of homelessness over time. So to me, an hour long call with a short diversion training is fully worth the idea that we're gonna help two people potentially out of homelessness. The more that we can do that, I feel like the more successful we'll be with that strategy over time. When I look at housing, so I went back and I just wrote a list and this is only what came to mind for me. So I apologize if I miss anything about what's been done this year related to housing or what we're looking at in the future. This year, the Housing Authority opened Johnson, Johnson Court. They're working on their East Coda project for two years out. You have the County Housing Authority working on Hollister Lofts in Goleta. You have Wilbridge opened a new house that they have now housed some people. You have Partners in Housing Solutions, which continues to do amazing work. As you look at their data, their data just gets better and better with the amount of people working with private landlords that they've been able to house. I was on the call yesterday with Tessa Madden Storms at PATH. So this is where you can use your little reactions and your applause to the partners that are doing all the hard work or put a smiley face or anything like that because you also have PATH and their LISA program, which has been successful. They have a new Housing First program to be moving into 2021 where they hope to house in the Housing First approach 25 per year in per perpetuity, potentially. Um, you have Good Sam has jumped into the housing market here. You have Transition House has worked on some new housing. I probably missed something. But you see a lot has accomplished this year, which is pretty amazing when you start to line it up. And I don't think we do that enough where we talk about what we've done, not just about where we're going. So to me, that's all pretty exciting stuff. Um, I apology if I- Well, uh, and Jeff, I do want to interrupt just in terms of time, but. But Rob said early on he had some good news. And since we're talking about amazing organizations and housing and shelter, Rob, do you want to share your good news now? Sure. <laughs> we can um, <laughs> sure. Well, um, Jeff mentioned 116 East Coda, and that development now has a formal name. It's uh, Veracruz Village. And okay. we, just yesterday, we received our uh, ABR consent approval for the change from the two bedrooms to the studio. So we're on our way now to having full entitlements to uh, submit our tax credit application in the first round of 2021. So uh, really excited about that moving forward. And then uh, other good news is yesterday, we just received notice from HUD that we have been awarded 75 additional mainstream vouchers for non-elderly disabled who are homeless or uh, at risk of homelessness. And uh, those will be effective uh, beginning January 1st to issue. So that's really good news because that's desperately needed our additional uh, house, housing vouchers. That's, that's what I had to share. Thank you, Rob. And I, 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 I went over it, but uh, Project Connect Home has been hugely successful with SBPD, CityNet, Housing Authority, Cottage, and PATH all collaborate, collaborating together. So that's another one that has been hugely successful this year. So we should just sit back for a minute and kind of take that in. And not to say there's still far, I know there's still far too many people out there. I'm in Alameda Park every week with about 50 to 60 individuals from the streets. There's one guy who's been homeless since 2005 that I know personally. It's a struggle for me to see that there's still work to be done. But we should also look back on what we've accomplished and continue to move the needle on all that. Um, and then the other thing is this whole idea of the Good Neighbor Handbook. I have a wonderful intern who's working on the Good Neighbor Handbook uh, for the Housing Authority, ground one. We just looked at it again this morning. Um, I think the Housing Authority likes kind of what we've done, but this whole handbook idea is basically a handbook that outreach shelter providers, housing providers can all use together to generally equip people to understand what they're getting into when they're newly housed. And uh, worded in a way, so it's not all jargony, but it's more relationally and, and, more, and more friendly, um, long-term in assisting people what they can expect to be a good, neighbor to their landlord, to their fellow neighbors, and to their neighborhood. That's kind of how it's broken up. 
lived experience. Um, I've got Roger and Chuck and Jim Wright has been involved in the past. He's also on the call and Roger and Chuck now are tag teaming to do our lived experience working group um, at Alameda Park. And so they have begun to talk with people experiencing homelessness and why this is so important because this will move us into the wrap discussion. Um, we have to be as client based as we can when it comes to helping families and individuals experiencing homelessness. And we have to understand from those folks, because I've never been homeless, what it's like, how the system has helped or the challenges they faced, and they, they need to be able to inform our system. So I'm very excited. We were kind of, COVID kind of stopped it for a while. We've restarted the idea. I'm very excited for this working group to inform our um, processes moving forward. Next slide, um, Barbara. Yeah, so just to wrap up quickly what Jeff communicated, this is, this is the work of our working groups, which is monthly facilitated meetings, coordination of partner agencies, addressing gaps in available resources, and collecting and analyzing data for learning. So we develop and implement strategies, we assess, refine, scale, or exit, and that we communicate to all of you progress. How is that strategy impacting our goal progress? Um, so again, just trying to capture this is what we're trying to facilitate and accomplish within those working groups. So moving on to regional action plans, we'll start here and then I just have a quick slide on um, some data, particular to neighborhoods. So Jeff, as you're speaking, I'll uh, click through. Okay. So we currently have three regional action plans, East Side, State Street, Alameda Park Neighborhood Navigation Center. These meet weekly. We have a call coming up in early December with some partners related to the um, waterfront who are maybe interested in the development of a regional action plan as well. The reason why we do regional action plans is again, um, most people experiencing homelessness will stay within an eight to 10 block region during the day. And so we want to bring resources to them uh, where they're at. The, the greatest success we can have is being client-based, building trust, bringing resources to, and then looking for that open window moment where people are ready to go into shelter, fill out that housing form, do a reunification, whatever it is. We also understand we need to do times where we move out people out of encampments or out of creek beds. But if we don't have this strategy in play long-term, we could just end up moving people around. And ultimately that's not what we want to do long-term, though we know for uh, you know, fire safety reasons, uh, water safety, all those things that needs to happen. We need to develop a long-term strategy of these regional action plans, including the Alameda Park Neighborhood Navigation Center to kind of figure out how are we doing helping people in regions. The other thing is there are some people on this call who can attest to this, either you're a city council member or you're the mayor or you're the person sending me the emails. But I, a lot of emails come up from concerned neighborhood partners and citizens and businesses. And if we can't have some way to respond in a reasonable fashion, that's not always the stick, meaning it can't always be law enforcement. There's gotta be a balance between carrot and stick of like, how are we gonna help you versus if there is something illegal happening, of course, we need, we need to allow SBPD to do their job. But to be successful, um, that's the only way as well that I can win over business members and neighborhood partners to our long-term solutions. If I can help in some way, if our team can help in some way day to day, they're more apt to listen to when we talk about housing. I've just learned that. And so it's a big piece of our educational work as well. It's our way of working with people who have never heard about housing first or never heard about reunification or never heard about, oh my gosh, you actually have all these partners doing work. We had no idea. I run into that all the time. So Barbara, if you want to move forward. So this is data specific to State Street. Again, um, CityNet led this effort supported by the city of Santa Barbara and incredible volunteers um, from the east side um, and other parts of Santa Barbara as well as the SBX team um, just in September of this year. Um, so this again was an effort to establish an understanding of baseline data as we go into these really concerted regional action plan efforts. Um, so what we're looking at at State Street is that 100 and, 150 excuse me, individuals were counted 
Um, 96 assessed, again, that they were willing to pr provide a level and depth of information that um, gives us an understanding of, of the type of individual that's experiencing homelessness in these neighborhoods. So again, 18% experiencing homelessness for less than a year. The reason why this is important is because this is when diversion and rapid resolution come into play. Um, and then 44% being from Santa Barbara. We're realizing too on State Street as well as the beachfront, we collected data on the beachfront specifically as well. Um, who's from Santa Barbara, who's from outside California. Again, looking at diversion and rapid resolution um, tools and strategies. Understanding you know, where they're sleeping at night. Again, how many are looking to and have looked at shelter and have capacity there versus outdoors or in their vehicles. We're also seeing growth in the number of individuals and families um, that are living in their vehicles. And we know we have incredible programs uh, like New Beginnings Counseling Center, Safe Parking Program, um, where you know, more capacity is always needed to, to help folks in need. And then East Side, specifically too, we, we counted 70 individuals of which 50 were assessed. Um, we're looking at 22% experiencing homelessness for less than a year. Again, huge opportunity to facilitate um, these short-term solutions with the regional action plans. More intensive case management and outreach. Eastside absolutely needs to be prioritized um, as one of the neighborhoods that, that are addressing um, a, an increase in individuals experiencing homelessness. And 58% of these individuals being from Santa Barbara. Again, we saw a growth here in terms of number of individuals and families in vehicles, and again, the predominant number of individuals on the east side sleeping outdoors. So here's the 100 person plan, Jeff, <laughs> in a slide. <laughs> in a slide. So we've been in communication with various partners, um, CityNet, our regional action plan partners, the city of Santa Barbara, some city staff, to discuss making sure we have capacity in 2021 through the regional action plans and the neighborhood navigation center to help 100 exit homelessness um, in 2021. And so these would be facilitated, basically the conversations and the, and the work um, would be facilitated, at SBAC would facilitate the meetings of which the partners come together to kind of do the work on the ground. Engaging uh, city council members, engaging neighborhood partners, business partners, all of our outreach partners. I'm even reaching out to NOAA's Anchorage and Behavioral Wellness and Public Health, everyone I can to get organized to work together as all these issues kind of uh, cross over and correlate. So some of the, per the, you know, we're looking at street exits. That's kind of the language that uh, CityNet uses from reunification, the permanent solutions, reunification, which we've already discussed in permanent housing, to the temporary solutions of getting people into shelter beds. So I've actually been on calls with both Ke um, Kevin with the Rescue Commission and again with Tessa, saying how many beds on an average night or day do you have open? Um, how can we communicate with you quickly and effectively? There are teams that already do this, law enforcement, city net, behavioral wellness, already do this. But when I'm looking at Alameda Park and there's somebody there at, at 6.30 and they're cold and they wanna go to the shelter that night, can I work with PATH? and CityNet to get a bed that evening. And they've both talked about uh, setting up a system for us where that can be accomplished relatively more quickly. Because again, it's all about that open window, that 24 hours, somebody says they're ready on Thursday, they might not be ready on Friday. And so it's trying to move the needle quickly to get these exits. So I believe this will, this will move us into that next 60 to 90 day plan by 20, January, 2021. Been talking to Laura about this idea, will we be able to move into Will we have the capacity to start in January of 2021 and create again 60 to 90 day plans with these wraps, which could include, um, like I said, something new on the waterfront. Um, but what that gives us as an option, which I feel like is really important, again, is educating and recruiting neighborhoods and business communities to partner with us. When we start to look at this, this more flexible private funding, once businesses and hotels get more healthy, which we all hope happens very soon that COVID is done. And once it becomes more health and the, they want to give toward things that work, but we need to prove that things work. So I feel like there's a lot of flexible funding and more energy and more advocacy. That's just wait, it's on the table for us. And we're trying to raise that up through the regional action plan. So I'm very excited about this because we'll be telling our regional action plan partners about this moving forward. 
and we really wanted to be specific in terms of not only what we're trying to achieve, um, but really prioritizing the, the regional or neighborhood based approach. And so there was a question just about beachfront. Um, and we are including beachfront in terms of the 100 person goal. Um, and we anticipate will be a separate regional action plan facilitated weekly. Um, so we just started meeting with waterfront or, or beachfront partners. Um, we do want to share again what we've learned, the data we've collected specific to the waterfront. Um, and again, are there opportunities um, to facilitate diversion, rapid resolution, and then longer term, more permanent solutions, as you see here on the slide, um, to again reduce the impact overall to that neighborhood as well. So um, we didn't want to present yet on the waterfront or beachfront regional action plan um, because it really is what we want to hear from business owners, community leaders, city staff in terms of how best to approach uh, that neighborhood. Um, but it is our assumption um, that it will be facilitated in a similar fashion. Any questions on regional action plan or working groups? Oh, and Sharon, Sharon, is there anything you want to share outside of the chat box, your experience and leadership and engagement, not only historically um, in neighborhoods like the East Side, but currently in Montecito is just absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you. Just, I don't want to keep anybody too long, but yeah, my, my experience so far has been when you get some demonstrable, when you take on a, a really concrete goal like this, and you start getting demonstrable results, everybody kind of wants to be a part of that. And I've been very surprised at the willingness to donate to these kinds of projects to, you know, uh, as you probably know, we've had Alpha Thrift on Milpas and shopping trips to people that were recently housed to help them get furnishings. I mean, there's a lot of resources in the community that we're not leveraging yet um, because those people don't really know how to get involved or how they could play, but everybody wants to be part of something successful. And honestly, we have needed a concrete goal like this to march to for a long time. That when you, when you put something out like this and everybody starts putting their head around, how do I make this happen? You'd be amazed what kind of resources open up. So I'm super excited to see this particular slide. Super excited. Great. I mean, we have folks like Jeff who know a thing or two and talk to you regularly. So <laughs> we appreciate that. And I, and I think too, those who are, you know, have lost every amount of patience with the crisis of homelessness, like our business owners that are struggling incredibly right now with the economic recession, we know we need to have a focused goal. We know we need to target resources. Um, and we know any opportunity to leverage additional resources is for this effort. So Thank you for, for echoing that and sharing your experiences, with, which has us um, facilitating um, our collaboration in this direction. So any other questions or comments before we close out today? I just wanna end with a couple of how we can engage and kind of next meeting items, but any general comments or feedback or questions? All right. Oh, wait, Roger, you have your raised hand. I see it. Uh, yes, um, I'll try to make it brief because we have very little time. Um, a key issue that I would like to address is I've, I've sent some emails and did not get a response. Um, a very important issue is, is drug and alcohol counselors that have a proven record of a high amount of successes of uh, individuals staying sober uh, for longer lengths of time than average. Um, I believe that it's very important that we find out who these drug and alcohol counselors are and implement them into what we're doing. Um, I, I have a key person that has worked at the Salvation Army and he was uh, very successful in helping me out with uh, my addiction and he has been with others. And I would like to get him involved in some way so that we can have a higher success rate where the problems are and where we can put people into sober living. Um, he's a very important person uh, to get involved in this issue. And also one other comment is when 
I made this comment before. When the police officers go out with city net, um, when they fold their hands down below their waist, and if it's the police officer that that first has the first question for the people that are that are being um, confronted, the first question should be: Is anyone hungry? Does anyone need water? That way, it breaks down the barriers of, um, of PTSD that a lot of us homeless people have had towards uh, police officers. So that's what I had I had and wanted to add for this particular meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. And and Susan, I mean, I did respond to two of your emails, but um, we are noting that mental health and drug and alcohol um, recovery as a topic that we're going to focus on at our next housing and shelter working group. Um, I just want to make sure that we're continuing that conversation. We know it's critical um, to addressing a lot of the disabling conditions that individuals experiencing homelessness experience as well. Um, so thank you for always providing that insight um, from your real lived experience. That's exactly why you're here in our, as part of our leadership team and why we want to include more of our voices of our lived experience um, in our, in, through our working group. So thank you so much for always providing those insights. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. All right, as we close out, um, again, how you can engage. So signing up for our newsletter, there, Landon is the go-to guy um, for both newsletter as well as sharing opportunities for us to, to educate and provide outreach. And again, share the work that we're doing share the common goals and strategies that we have and are focused on moving forward, as well as get feedback, um, gain insight, understand concerns, and be able to really work on a mutually beneficial and mutually supportive solutions. If you want to participate in a working group, um, please email me. And then regional action plans, that, that's Jeff. Um, so it's all just our first name at fbact.org. Um, and again, as we look to the end of the year, if you have resources to contribute, We'll, we'll, we'll always welcome those as well. Um, and you can go to our website, sbact.org, to do that. And there's a specific pull down that's for homelessness um, if you want your dollars targeted for that purpose. And, and I want to acknowledge too that our partners is what makes all of this happen. We were able to have a beautiful event this last Saturday to share our gratitude to all of you, um, as well as our donors that make all of this happen. Um, but thank you so much. I know it's been a tough year for you and your teams, um, and we're so appreciative of your hard work, your diligence, your passion, and commitment. Um, and we will do everything we can to help you, support you, remove barriers, address challenges, uh, and work collaboratively going into 2021. So thank you all so much. Happy holidays, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the new year. Thanks, Barbara. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, and much gratitude to everyone. Thank you for all that thank you're you. doing.